Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. So I want to start off um, this this class with uh, a very beautiful hadith. It kind of it, it kind of gives us that motivation as we're going into the second half right now of Ramadan, particularly the last ten nights. Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Iltamisuha fil ashr al awakhir. Search for that night in the last ten night. Yani Laylat al Qadri, meaning the night of Al Qadr. He says, Fa in Lawfu Ahadukum awa ajaza. If if one of you found yourselves to be lazy or weak during the the first half of Ramadan or the first part of Ramadan, Fala Yuglabanna ala Sabi al Bawaki. Then don't let him be lazy with the last seven nights. All right, so the Prophet ﷺ said, seek it in the last ten nights, and if you felt like you know you had a, a, a rough Ramadan, you didn't do that well, then don't mess up in the last week of Ramadan. Make sure that you catch the last week of Ramadan and you find Laylatul Qadr. Now, uh, earlier in the hadith study on the, the virtues of Ramadan in, uh, in discussing this topic, we said that the Prophet ﷺ has three ahadith. مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانًا إِمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ The Prophet ﷺ says, whoever fasts Ramadan with iman and with ihtisab, with faith and seeking accountability, he's forgiven for all of his sins. He also said, مَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانًا Whoever prays Qiyamul Layl throughout Ramadan, إِمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ Then he's forgiven for all of his sins. And he says, مَنْ قَامَ لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ Whoever stands up and just catches Laylatul Qadr, Iman and Wahtisaban, Ghufira Lahu Ma Taqaddama Min Dambihi, then he's forgiven for all of his sins. And the ulama say that each one is a safety net for the other. Meaning if there is deficiency in your fasting, your qiyam will catch you, inshaAllah. And if there is deficiency in your taraweeh and your qiyam, Laylatul Qadr will salvage the entire month and in fact an entire lifetime. Bidnillahi Ta'ala. So what is you know, what are the ways that the Prophet described this particular night, what are some of the virtues of this night? What are some of the things that we should be looking for? Um, there's, a, there's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ speaks about this concept of deprivation. And what that means is, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deprives you of Laylatul Qadr, it, makes, it means that you're a deprived person. It means that your sins are getting in the way of you being able to catch Laylatul Qadr. Whereas if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like when we say that if a person does hajj, it's because they're, they're the guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Likewise, if Allah allows you to catch Laylatul Qadr, it's that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed something amazing for you. And so the Prophet says in an authentic hadith, he says, إِنَّ هَذَا الشَّهْرَ قَدْ حَضَرَكُمْ That this month has come upon you. وَفِيهِ لَيْلَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٍ And in it is a night that is greater than a thousand months. مَنْ حُرِمَهَا فَقَدْ حُرِمَ الْخَيْرَ كُلَّهُ Whoever is deprived of it is deprived of all good. وَلَا يُحْرَمُ خَيْرُهَا إِلَّا مَحْرُومُ And no one would be deprived of the good of this night except for one who is deprived. And what that means is mahroom, that there is something that's keeping you between you and Allah, that's keeping you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah azza wa jal would prevent you from the khayr of this night because of that sin that you're insisting upon. So really in these last couple of nights, before you go into the last 10 nights, one of the main things you should keep in mind here is that I need to do away with those things that would make me mahroom, that would make me a deprived individual, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't deprive me of the good of this night. So, you know, there are things that we actually keep in mind as we're going into the last 10 nights, particularly in regards to our sayyat and the things that we do that would keep us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the idea here, if you're deprived, that means that there is a reason why Allah has chosen you to be amongst those who are deprived. If you're amongst those who catch it, and who catch the blessings of it, there is a reason why Allah chose you to be amongst those who would catch the blessing of it. And so we find that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ إِذَا دَخَلَ الْعَشْرُ أَحْيَا اللَّيْلَ وَأَيْقَضَ أَهْلَهُ وَجَدَّ وَشَدَّ الْمِئْزَرَ That the Prophet وسلم, whenever the last ten nights would come, أَحْيَا اللَّيْلَ like he, he gave life to the night. SubhanAllah, what that means is he spent the entire night in prayer. Ahya layla. The entire night was, was, was given life by the ibadat of the Prophet ﷺ, by the acts of worship of the Messenger ﷺ. وَأَيْقَضَ أَهْلَهُ But that didn't stop him from waking up his family. He woke his family up as well. And he became very serious and he tied his waist belt. Meaning, you know, the Prophet ﷺ wanted to remain in standing 
the entire night in these particular nights. And Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he showed Nafir, he took Nafir radiallahu anhu to the place that the Prophet sallallahu used to pitch his tent. And he said Rasulullah sallallahu used to pitch his tent in this particular spot in the masjid. And he said that Rasulullah sallallahu would not leave that tent except for a haja, except for a need, or to say salam to his family. You know, sometimes the Prophet sallallahu would, would, would go and, and say salam to his family. He would dip his head into the room of Aisha radiallahu anha and she would comb his hair. He would exchange a few words and then the Prophet sallallahu went right back to that same spot. Which gives you, by the way, you know, it gives you an idea that in these last 10 nights, you need to, you need to set, set yourself up for success. And what that means is, you know, a lot of times people jump around from masjid to masjid in the last 10 nights. But what's preferable, even if you're not doing i'tikaf, just for the sake of your spirituality, as Ibn Qudama rahimahullah says, even if you're not doing i'tikaf, find the same spot to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in for the entire 10 nights. So that you associate ibadah with that spot. So think about it, if the first night, you had an amazing night, then the minute you see that spot again, you're going to remember what you had last night. And if you keep that going for 10 nights, then there's a continuity there of connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abdullah ibn Umar says he used to stay there the entire night. وَكَانَ يُحْيِي layl And he said what Aisha said. He used, to, he used to spend the entire night giving life to it with his ibadat. He, he would not take a break alayhi salatu was salam in that particular, uh, in that particular state. Now the Messenger وسلم, used to do this in the last 10 nights. Um, one of the things that we see however, is that one year he did 20 nights. And the reason why he did 20 nights, for those of you that took Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, the Mothers of the Believers class, you'll see that some of the wives of the Prophet وسلم, started to set up tents next to the Prophet وسلم's tent. And essentially one wife set up a tent, so the other wife got jealous, she set up a tent, so the other wife got jealous, she set up a tent, and the Prophet وسلم, he left Irtikaf that year, subhanAllah. And he said that if you did this for Allah, then you're going to stay and you're going to do this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you did it for some sort of competition, then it's going to be in waste anyway. So the Messenger وسلم, he didn't stay in that tent for that particular year. But then the next year, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did 20 days of Irtikaf. And this was the way the Prophet وسلم, used to operate and function as well, was that he used to make up deeds that he missed. In fact, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says that's why we find that the Prophet ﷺ used to fast almost all of Sha'ban because he was making up voluntary days he missed in the past. Meaning if the Prophet ﷺ missed a Monday or Thursday or three days of the month that he used to do, then when Sha'ban came, the Prophet ﷺ even wanted to compensate and make up for those voluntary fasts. So he had his particular spot وسلم, for these last ten nights and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Laylatul Qadr, He says, Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatin Mubaraka. Allah calls it a blessed night. Now, if you remember from the study of Ramadan, the Messenger وسلم, called Ramadan Shahr Mubarak. It's a blessed month. Now, the word Mubarak, what does it mean in this context? And Imam ibn al Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala says, it means Allah. It means that Allah multiplies your deeds exponentially. So Ramadan is a month where if something is done within that month, it's multiplied exponentially, right? And Laylatul Qadr is a night from the month of Ramadan, where if you do something in that night, it's multiplied even more. So it's called Layla Mubaraka by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself. We find a narration from Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. In this narration, I have to be very clear that, you know, a lot of people take things out of context. Ibn Abbas actually had names for the 15th of Sha'ban, he named that night and he named Laylatul Qadr and he named the night of Eid to himself, all right, and to the, to the Sahaba basically to illustrate a concept. So he used to call, actually this is where the, there's no hadith that calls the 15th of Sha'ban Laylatul Bara, the night where the souls are freed. And there are a lot of innovative practices that take place on the 15th of Sha'ban, on Nisr Sha'ban. We know that the Prophet ﷺ said that on the, on the, on, in, in the middle of Sha'ban, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks to His creation. And Allah azza wa jal forgives anyone who's not carrying shirk or carrying a major sin or so on and so forth. Okay? But there are no specific practices associated with the night. However, it's a blessed night just for that fact, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks to His ibad, He looks to His servants, and He frees them from hellfire. So Ibn Abbas anhu called it Laylatul Bara'a. Then Ibn Abbas called Laylatul Qadr Laylatul Ta'zim. 
Laylatul Ta'zim, which means the night in which you glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A night of glory. Okay, but Ta'zim here is you're the one that's doing the glorification. Right? A night in which you glorify Allah. So Allah frees you from your sins before Ramadan even comes in in Sha'ban. Allah Azza wa Jal already writes you from Al-Utaqa if you're a believer, from those who are freed if you're a believer. And we ask Allah to make us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. And then you have Layla to Ta'zim, where you push yourself in that night of Ta'zim, of glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in ways that you've never pushed yourself before. Then he called Layla to Eid, the night of Eid, Layla to Jaiza, the night of payment. Alright, why did he call it Layla to Jaiza? The Sahaba asked him, you know, why, would, why wouldn't you call Layla to Qadr the night of, of payment, the payment of your good deeds? He said, because the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, and this is a hadith that's married in Muslim Imam Ahmad, وَيُوَفَّى فِيهَا الْأَجِيرُ أَجْرَهُ Speaking about Laylatul Eid, about the night of Eid, that he is given, you know, or the one who is owed compensation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given their compensation. قَالُوا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَهِيَ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ They asked the Prophet ﷺ, is that Laylatul Qadr? قَالَ لَا قَالَ إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّى الْأَجِيرَ أَجْرَهُ إِذَا أَنْهَى عَمَلَ The Prophet ﷺ says that you're given your compensation when you finish your deeds. So there are these three steps that Ibn Abbas عنه, was mentioning to us. First, Allah clears the way for us. Then we push ourselves in glorification. Then, بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى When the night of Eid comes, we receive the full reward of everything that we've done. So those are some of the names of Laylatul Qadr. Now what are the special virtues of Laylatul Qadr? Number one, first and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Qur'an in this night. And that makes it more special than any other night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ That we have revealed it on Laylatul Qadr, on the night of Al-Qadr. And in fact, as Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the greatest Qadr of anyone. He has the greatest status of anyone. And he sent on that night the angel with the greatest qadr, the angel with the greatest status, being Jibreel alayhi salam, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam of the greatest qadr. And he sent to that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam the book with the greatest qadr of all of his revelations. And he sent it in the month of the greatest qadr of all of the months of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a very special night. Um, Rasulullah Sallallahu actually tells us that all of the revelations were revealed, in Ramadan in particular. Okay, so he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the suhuf of Ibrahim Alayhi Salaam, the scrolls of Abraham, were revealed on the first night of Ramadan. And he said the, in, the uh, Torah was revealed on the sixth of Ramadan. And he says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the Injil was revealed on the thirteenth of Ramadan. And then he says the Zabur, the Psalms, were revealed on the eighteenth of Ramadan. And he said the Qur'an was revealed on the 24th of Ramadan. So again, the first suhuf of Ibrahim were the first of Ramadan. Then you had the Torah on the 6th of Ramadan. Then you had the Injil on the 13th of Ramadan. Then you had al zabur the, the Psalms, on the 18th of Ramadan. Then you had Al-Qur'an on the 24th of Ramadan. That's an authentic hadith in Ibn Hibban and Al-Tabarani. Now, this, this brings about many questions. Um, is Laylatul Qadr the 24th of Ramadan then? Or is it the 24th day, which would make it the 25th night? Or is it the 24th night? And hence it's not only an odd night that Laylatul Qadr can be. So the ulama, they discuss this. Uh, some of them bring some very interesting evidences. And Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala says that Jibreel revealed, or, or Jibreel reviewed the Qur'an with the Prophet sallallahu a total of how many times? Think about it. How many times did Jibreel used to review the Qur'an with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Ramadan? One time, right? Every night he'd review one time with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or he reviewed the Qur'an with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, completing the entire Qur'an in Ramadan. The last year of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, how many times did Jibreel Alayhi Wasallam review it with him? Two times. And how many years of revelation were there? Twenty-three. So that would mean Jibreel reviewed the Qur'an with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how many times? Twenty-four times. So that's an interesting evidence that Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah uses to say that Laylatul Qadr would be on the 25th night then. Okay, the 24th day, the 25th night. Now the greater difference of opinion in this entire concept is what was revealed. Or was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about Tida al-Wahi, the beginning of the revelation to the Prophet sallallahu or another form of revelation. Abdullah ibn Abbas says it has two meanings. 
or there's a difference of opinion, it could be one of two things. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Qur'an in one shot to Baytul Izzah, the house of glory, in a written form from al al Mahfuz, from the preserved tablet. And we know this, this is established through the authentic hadith, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah azza wa jal preserved the Qur'an, He took the Qur'an from al al Mahfuz and preserved it in what's known as al Baytul Izzah which is in its own separate heaven, the first heaven, which means the house of glory, and it's in its written form. Does that mean that Jibreel would just go to Bayt al-Izzah? No, because the Prophet ﷺ says, when Allah speaks to Jibreel with the revelation, which means that it's there in its written form, and then Jibreel ﷺ reveals the Qur'an to the Prophet ﷺ directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in its portion. So one opinion is that on Laylatul Qadr, that is the revelation, that's the descent that's being described. Anzalnahu means from al al Mahfuz to Bayt al Izzah. And this was the opinion of many scholars. The second opinion is that it's Ibtida al Wahi, the beginning of the revelation to the Prophet. And this was the opinion of Imam al Sha'bi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, that this is when Hira, this is when Jibreel came to the Prophet in Hira with the first few verses of Surah Al Alaq. Okay? And subhanAllah, they, they support, you know, they have many evidences for that. One of them is that chronologically, you know, when the Prophet ﷺ received Surah Al-Alaq, it definitely was Ramadan. And back then Ramadan was called Na'iq. The name of the month was Na'iq. So it came down to the Prophet ﷺ on the ninth month of the lunar calendar. So it makes sense that it was the beginning of Wahi. Some of the ulama, they even said that... Uh, that it came with, with five verses, Surah Al-Alaq, which is the surah before Surah Al-Qadr. Jibreel Islam came to the Prophet Islam with five verses initially. And Surah Al-Qadr is five verses. Okay, so there's, that there's a connection, there's a correlation between the two. That this was Ibtida Al-Wahi. And then some of the scholars said that it could be both. Okay, because both, you know, the revelation from al al Mahfuz to Bayt al izzah could have been in Ramadan on Laylatul Qadr as well as the beginning of the Wahi to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, the way that you look at this from a Qur'anic perspective, Ibn Abbas Sallallahu Anhu prefers the first opinion. Why? Because he says, Anzalnahu, Anzalnahu means one time. So it's one descent. So it's referring to the descent on Laylatul Qadr from al al Mahfuz to al Bayt al izzah When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرِ That we were the ones that caused the revelation to descend upon the Prophet ﷺ. نَزَّلْنَا means over a period of time. Okay, so it's not just one time. It's over a period of time. And then Allah finally says, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانِ أَلَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ the month of Ramadan in which the Qur'an was revealed, which again indicates one descent. So there is a, so Laylatul Qadr would be the night, and Allah knows best, that the Qur'an was revealed from al al Mahfud, or it was taken from the preserved tablet and placed in Al-Bayt Al-Izzah. However, it could also be the night that the Prophet Wasallam's revelation started as well. Okay, Because it is, a, it is a blessed night, and there is no limitation to its barakah. So Allah Azza wa could have blessed it in numerous ways. So it could, re- it could refer to both forms of revelation. Also Allah Azza wa says about this night, فِيهَا يُفْرَقُ كُلُّ أَمْرٍ حكيم. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, decrees every precise matter. So it's a night of decree. And Imam bin Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala, he says about this, he says, أَيْ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ يفصل من اللوح المحفوظ إلى الكتبة أمر السنة that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that night takes the decree from اللوح المحفوظ the preserved tablet and gives it to the angels and that decree is for the upcoming year he says وَمَا يَكُونُ فِيهَا مِنَ الْأَجَالِ, من الأجال وَالْأَرْزَاقِ and, and basically everyone's lifespans and their risk, their sustenance that's been decreed for the year and he says وَمَا يَكُونُ فِيهَا إِلَى آخِرِهَا Everything that would happen in that year until the end of the year. So basically until the next Laylatul Qadr. Until the next Laylatul Qadr. And he says this is what was narrated from Ibn Umar and from Mujahid and from Abdul and many others. And Ibn Abbas ta'ala anhu went so far to say that even the names of the people that will go to Hajj for that year are decreed on Laylatul Qadr. The angels are given the scrolls with the names of the people in Ihram. Subhanallah. So it's a night in which everything that's going to happen for the next year 
is 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 rolled out. It's it's decreed by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and it's and uh, and and it's a mercy from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that Allah chooses that night to decree. Why? Because what will most of us be doing? Worshiping Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And the Prophet Sallallahu he mentioned, for example, that he would fast Mondays and Thursdays because al-a'mal tu'radu ala Allah. They, their, our actions are presented to Allah on the days of Monday and Thursday. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wanted to be in a state of fasting when the deeds were presented to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So Laylatul Qadr is the night, you know, in which number one, if you're a Muslim, you know, for for the most likely you would have been fasting that day unless you had some form of excuse. So you're already in a state of siyam. So you've already gotten that. With the Prophet ﷺ made a connection, a favorability between fasting and having the deeds presented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you've already gotten that. In fact, you have three weeks of fasting. Right? At least three weeks of fasting before that even happens. On top of that, you're probably praying taraweeh. You've probably worshiped, you're probably worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those ten nights more than any other nights of the year. And Allah Azza wa Jal could have just chosen any day of the year to be the yearly decree. And it could have just been random. But instead Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives it to you within these 10 nights so that you can push yourself. Because you're going to be making dua in these 10 nights, aren't you? You're inevitably going to be asking for matters of the dunya as well as matters of the akhirah. So you're pushing yourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses that to be the night that He decrees. Some of the ulama, they said that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only decrees rahmah. Because in those last 10 nights, فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الرَّحْمَةِ وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ Right, the doors of mercy are open and the doors of hellfire are closed. Some of them said that Allah only decrees mercy on that night. Some of them said Allah decrees everything, but He decrees in the spirit of mercy. And that's the more correct opinion. What that means is everything's going to be decreed because our lifespans are decreed. Inevitably, there's going to be some, you know, some people that are going to pray on that night and they're going to suffer in their risk. But that's because Allah deemed it better for them. And that decree came with a decree of mercy, not with a decree of punishment. You understand the difference between the two? Everything is decreed, but it's decreed within that spirit of mercy. Everything that's going to happen is going to happen through that lens of rahmah for you. And there is no better night of the year that you would want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreeing what's going to happen with your job, what's going to happen with your life, what's going to happen with your hajj plans or your umrah plans. You wouldn't want it to be any other night other than Laylatul Qadr. So it's Laylatul Mubarakah, it's a blessed night, the night Allah reveals the Qur'an, the night of decree. And of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Laylatul Qadri khayrun min alfi shahr. It's better than a thousand nights. Notice that Allah did not say Laylatul Qadri ka alfi shahr. That the night of decree is like a thousand months. Allah said khayrun min alfi shahr, which means it's open. Okay, it could be better than two thousand months, it could be better than a thousand years. It's better than a thousand months. Now what's the, what's the context of that? The ulama debated first of all, is Allah Azza wa Jal being, is this literal to say a thousand months or is this just talking about al-kathra? Is this, this just talking about abundance? Like this is greater than a thousand months. Like when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوَدُّ أَحَدُهُمْ لَوْ يُعَمَّرُ أَلْفَ سَنَةً That the disbelievers would have wished to live for a thousand years. Okay, so is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being literal or is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demonstrating al-kathra or al-wafra, that this will be an abundance, that this is greater than anything you could ever achieve in life. Now, there's a narration from Mujahid and Ibn Jarir. It's munqata', it's not traced to the Prophet sallallahu there's a missing link. A tabi'i or tabi'i narrating something of the Prophet sallallahu That the Prophet sallallahu saw a man from Bani Israel that used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 83 years. He lived for 83 years. A thousand months equals 83 years. And the Prophet ﷺ saw this man from Bani Israel worshipping for 83 years. And every single night he prayed Qiyamul Layl. And he would spend his days in jihad fi sabirillah. He spent his days striving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in battle and so on and so forth. And ta'ajjab alayhi salatu wassalam. The Prophet ﷺ was impressed by this man. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to us in one night. What would otherwise need to be achieved in 30,000 nights, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to us in one night. Allah azza wa said, this is a gift to your ummah. 
So that's one narration. Another narration which doesn't necessarily contradict, this is a narration from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and this narration is sahih. Anas radiallahu anhu says, إِنَّ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أُرِيَ أَعْمَارَ النَّاسِ قَبْلَهُ أَوْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنْ ذَلِكَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed the Prophet sallallahu the lifespans of people that came before this ummah. So the Prophet sallallahu he feared. Why? فَكَأَنَّهُ تَقَاصَرَ أَعْمَارَ أُمَّتِهِ أَن لَا يَبْلُغُوا مِنَ الْأَعْمَالِ مِنَ الْأَعْمَالِ مِثْلَ الَّذِي بَلَغَ غَيْرُهُمْ So the Prophet ﷺ was afraid because, you know, it seemed like the lifespans of the ummah that came before were a lot longer. And Rasulullah ﷺ says, أَعْمَارُ أُمَّتِ بَيْنَ السِّتِينَ وَالسَّبْعِينَ That the, the lifespan of my ummah is between 60 and 70 years. So the Prophet ﷺ sees the lifespans that Bani Israel had and, and the nations that came before them. And he was afraid. So he would be afraid that they would not be able to do uh, the things that the ummas that came before did. So Anas radiallahu anhu says, فَأَعْطَاهُ اللَّهُ لَيْلَةَ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٍ Allah gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Laylatul Qadr, which is greater than a thousand months. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us some, because if our lifespans are average between 60 and 70 years, then Allah gave us what is greater than 83 years. Um, in ibadah. There's one more narration, and it's a weak narration, but it is in the books of Sunan. So I'll mention it, because it's in a tirmidhi and others, but it's a weak narration. Uh, and it has political connotations to it, which is why I'll squash it now as a da'if hadith, because I'm sure it probably is going to circulate at some point if it hasn't already circulated. Um, that when Al-Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, wa radiallahu an abi, when he gave the bay'ah to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, when Al-Hassan made peace with Muawiyah, Someone stood up and said that you've made fools of the believers, that you've you've uh, you've uh, mocked the believers. And Al Hassan said, "How can you? You know?" He said, uh, "Rahimakallah, may Allah have mercy on you." He says the Prophet ﷺ had a dream, in which he saw Bani Umayyah upon the minbar, meaning he saw Bani Umayyah in you know ruling the ummah. So he said, "Allah subhanahu wa taala revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, Inna a'tainak al kawfar." Okay, that what we have given to you is Al-Kawthar, the fountain, the river. Alright? Then, after that, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ That we have, you know, given you the night of Al-Qadr, which is better than a thousand months. And now this is the interesting part of the narration. Al-Qasim, he says that we counted the months that Bani Umayyah ruled the Ummah, and it came out to exactly a thousand months. <laughs> So he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet ﷺ, you have longer even than that. So this narration is, is a da'if narration, uh, but I thought I'd mention it because it's found in the books of Sunan. Now, what is the, the most amazing thing I came across, honestly, in, in this entire discussion of a thousand months? I came across a narration from an Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala. And it's beautiful. He said that Surah Al-Kawthar was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ right before Surah Al-Qadr. Surah Al-Kawthar is a gift to who? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَرِ We've given you al-kawthar, فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرِ Right, so Allah Azza wa Jal gave the gift to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of the fountain. And Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted a gift not only for himself, but for the ummah as a whole. So Allah Azza wa Jal revealed Surah Al-Qadr. Subhanallah, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wasn't satisfied with something just for him, and this is the nature of our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ummati, ummati, his one dua on the, on the day of judgment would be intercession for the ummah. And so he said, that's why you find the closeness of revelation between Surah Al-Kawthar and Surah Al-Qadr. Allah gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a gift, then he gave a gift to the ummah as a whole, uh, out of love to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and out of his mercy to the ummah. Finally, we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرِ سلام. سَلَامٌ هِيَ حَتَّى مَطْبَعِ الْفَجْرِ Allah Azza wa Jal says that of the blessings of this night is that the angels are constantly coming down and by the angels constantly coming down and saying salam upon the believers, the night is tranquil. There's a tranquility on the night of Al-Qadr that is unlike the tranquility found throughout the year. And Imam al-Sha'bi rahimahullah ta'ala says, and there is not a single masjid or group of people or individual that is praying except that the angels have, you know, are, are, are covering the span between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reporting their names to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sending salam upon the believers. Can't, you, know, you can't imagine, subhanAllah, how many malaika 
are coming down on that night. In fact, that's why some of the ulama said it's called Laylatul Qadr, because Qadr means that it's constriction, it's restricted, that the space in the heavens is restricted because of the amount of angels ascending and descending. There's no space in the heavens, subhanAllah, because of how many of them are coming down and sending salam upon the believers. And it makes sense, the angels love ibadah, they love worship, they love prayer, they love tawbah, they love istighfar, they love sadaqah. And on Laylatul Qadr, there is more of that than any other night. So the amount of angels that are coming down, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? He said in a hadith from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, إِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَ تِلْكَ اللَّيْلَةِ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَكْثَرُ مِنْ عَدَدِ الْحَصَى The Prophet ﷺ says that the amount of angels on that night are greater than the number of stones on the earth. The mountains that are made of stones and the amount of hasa and hasa these are the smallest rocks, right? There are more angels on the earth on that night than the small rocks of this world. Think about all of the mountains, think about all of the pebbles outside. There are more angels than that. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, zada alayha. He, he basically commented on this hadith. He said there are even more than the stars in the galaxy. There are more angels on that night than the rocks on the earth, the pebbles on the earth, and the stars in the galaxy looking for people and sending salam upon them. The angels look for halaqat of dhikr on regular days. They look for the people remembering Allah. They look for the circles of knowledge. They look for salah and qiraat al-Qur'an. They come to salat al-Fajr. Right? In the Qur'an al-Fajr, kana mashhuda. They, they, they look forward to the recitation of al-Fajr. So what about then these nights where people, where the masajids are full throughout the world and the people are standing up and reading Qur'an and praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa says, وَالرُّوحُ فِيهَا Jibreel alayhi salam basically commemorates the initial revelation. He's the one that brought it to the Prophet ﷺ the first time on this night, according to that opinion. Right. And Jibreel is coming down every single Ramadan in Laylatul Qadr, sending salam upon the believers as a whole. And Imam al-Sa'di rahimahullah says, وَأَيُّ شَرَفٍ هَذَا What a great nobility that is, that was re reserved previously for Khadija radiallahu anha, who received the salam of Jibreel and people like that, Maryam alayhi salam. What a sharaf that the believers as a whole have that opportunity that Jibreel is sending salam upon them. And the angels as a whole are sending salam upon them. Now, Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the earth, of course, every night in Ramadan, doesn't he? Because he's reviewing the Qur'an with the Prophet ﷺ. But this is a, this is a night that it, the salam of Jibreel extends to all of the people, which means the salam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends to everyone as well. Now Allah Azza wa says, هِيَ حَتَّى مَطْلَعِ الْفَجْرِ And I really want to really make a point here, that Allah says, it's all the way until Fajr comes in. You know, if you go to most masajid, the programs, people finish their qiyam around what, like 4 a.m., and then there's the suhoor and the conversations and the discussions and stuff like that, and then the fajr adhan, someone might take a nap or something like that. But Allah says, it's until fajr comes in. Now, when does Laylatul Qadr start? What do you guys think, those of you that are here? When does Laylatul Qadr start? Maghrib. Can you imagine how messed up it would be if you prayed the entire night, but your entire Laylatul Qadr was, was, was nullified because you had iftar and you made a dumb joke, or you backbited while you were eating iftar with people? So it's important to keep in our minds that Laylatul Qadr is from the Adhan of Maghrib to the Adhan of Fajr. It starts at Maghrib. So when you eat your iftar, keep to yourself, keep quiet, keep indulged in dhikr even as you're eating your food, when you finish your food, go worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until Isha comes in. Finish your Isha, finish your Taraweeh. The point is, as Mujahid rahimahullah says, most people lose Laylatul Qadr because of their interactions with people. And there's, there's a hadith which he uses as evidence, which I'll bring here by the way, inshallah ta'ala in a moment. But most people will miss out on Laylatul Qadr because they're too busy talking, they're arguing, they're, they're getting into discussions. And when you, when you use your tongue for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's only... It's only natural that you're going to mess up at some point. So keep in mind, it starts from Maghrib and it goes all the way until Fajr. Hiya hatta matla al Fajr. It's until Fajr comes out. So even if you're going to eat iftar and suhoor with people, make sure that you watch your, your, your adab, your manners, and so on and so forth, and you don't say anything that you're going to regret that could make you miss out on a lifetime of good deeds. Now the discussion comes when is Laylatul Qadr? So, all of those 10 nights you need to watch yourself from iftar to suhoor basically to the, to the adhan of fajr. When is Laylatul Qadr? And this discussion by the way, um, 
it, it, can be, it, can, it can be a little shocking. The conclusion might be a little bit shocking, at least my own personal conclusion, Allahu Alam. But uh, it's a very, very in-depth discussion. And you find multiple opinions here. You find the opinion of Ikrama, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, rahimahullah. Ikrama, who is the, the tabi'i, not the sahabi, great scholar of the Qur'an, who believed that Laylatul Qadr was the 15th of Sha'ban. And the ulama say that he's mardud in that. That's a rejected opinion. Why? Because Allah says, Shahru Ramadan, alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. So the Qur'an was revealed in Ramadan. So no matter how you cut it up, there's no way that Laylatul Qadr can be outside of Ramadan. You find the opinion of Imam Ibn Hazm rahimahullah ta'ala who said it's the 20th or the 21st night. The very beginning of those 10 nights. It's at the onset of the 10 nights. And the rest of the night is just, the rest of the nights are just honoring that first or second night. You find the early opinion of Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and some group of the companions that said it's the 23rd of Ramadan. They actually thought it was the, the 23rd of Ramadan. You find the opinion of Ibn Umar who said it's the 24th or the 25th based upon that hadith of when the scriptures were revealed. So he obviously holds the second opinion as to what it means to say that the Qur'an was revealed in Ramadan. So he believes that it was ibtida' al-wahi as well with the Prophet ﷺ. So he says the 24th or the 25th of Ramadan. Then you find uh, the opinion of a large group of companions, Ubay ibn Ka'b, Muawiyah, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu in his later opinion that it is definitely the 27th night of Ramadan. So that's not just some opinion that people made up. All right, There's actually solid grounding for that to believe that it is definitely the 27th night of Ramadan. There are Sahaba that swore by it, which we'll mention inshallah ta'ala. And then you find the opinion of some like Imam Ahmad, Imam Malik, Sufyan al-Thawri and others that tatanaqqal, that every year it's a different night. So when you find a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ specified a night, it was for that year in particular. Okay? So let's go through these evidences. All right? And, and that, that opinion you know, is there as well. And it's, uh, you know, there, there are many different weak hadith as well. So there's a weak hadith that, that I've seen circulating. And it's, it is a weak hadith, meaning it's in the books of hadith, but it's a da'if hadith. That if, the odd, if an odd night of the last ten nights coincides with Laylatul Jum'ah, with the night of Friday, then that's Laylatul Qadr. I remember it actually happened a few years ago, and a lot of people were passing around that hadith in particular. So it's a weak hadith. All right? Um, and Imam al-Razi rahimahullah ta'ala says, in any case, the reason why the Prophet ﷺ did not tell us when Laylatul Qadr was definitively, was that we would fall into sin at that point if we didn't honor the night. You know, it's one thing if you're looking for the last ten nights and you take a break on some nights and you don't really know when Laylatul Qadr is. And it's another thing if Allah and the Messenger ﷺ tell you Laylatul Qadr is this night and you still don't do anything about it. Then at that point you risk being even sinful due to your neglect. All right? Because it becomes such a form of ingratitude. So let's go through the evidences. Now the evidences that I chose, some of these ahadith are very redundant. I chose the ones that have stories in them just because I like those. All right? The first one is from Abu Salama radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says, I went to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu and I said, you know, can you take a walk with us and talk to us about the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he said he came out and we started to walk in, in the garden. And I asked him, tell me what you heard from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam regarding Laylatul Qadr. So listen to what he says. He says, the first Ramadan, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made i'tikaf the first ten nights. فَاعْتَكَفْنَا مَعَ so we did i'tikaf with him as well, the first ten nights. He said, then just as he finished those first ten nights, Jibreel alayhi salam came to him and says, إِنَّ الَّذِي تَطْلُبُ amamak," That which you're seeking is still ahead of you. So the Prophet ﷺ came out to the companions and he said, Jibreel alayhi salam came to me, and this is authentic hadith by the way, Jibreel came to me and he said, it's still ahead of us. So they did i'tikaf for the second ten nights. SubhanAllah, so the first twenty nights of Ramadan were spent in i'tikaf. And he says that Jibreel Islam came to him on the twentieth night as the twentieth day and says, Inna ladi tatlubu amamak, that which you're seeking is still ahead of you. So he says, Faqama fina alayhi salatu salam khatib and the Prophet stood up to give us a speech, and this was the morning of the twentieth of Ramadan. The Prophet says, I was informed of Laylatul Qadr in my dream, meaning the Prophet saw a dream of Laylatul Qadr, and he said, But I forgot the exact night. So he said, look for it in the odd nights of the last ten nights of Ramadan. And he said, I saw myself prostrating in mud and water on that night. So what the Prophet ﷺ saw of Laylatul Qadr in his dream on that night was rain. And again, they didn't have carpet in the masjid of the Prophet 
So he saw as he rose from sujood alayhi salatu wasalam in his dream, he had mud all over his face. So he told the Sahaba, that's what I saw in, in that dream. So Abu Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that the Prophet says, so whoever wants to seek it out, keep doing i'tikaf. So subhanAllah, they did i'tikaf the entire Ramadan. In that Ramadan. So Abu Sa'id says, فَاعْتِكَفْنَا We stayed with the Prophet ﷺ. That must have been an amazing Ramadan. Can you imagine 30 days with the Prophet ﷺ in i'tikaf? Allahu Akbar. So he said, the people stayed in i'tikaf. And he said, there was no trace of clouds in the sky. Meaning, we're looking out the first few nights and we see no clouds in the sky. He says, then all of a sudden, the clouds filled up the skies. Rasulullah ﷺ stood up and he prayed that entire night. And the Prophet ﷺ put his face in sujood. And when the Prophet ﷺ rose from sujood on that particular night, his face was covered in mud alayhi salatu wasalam. And he said that was the 23rd night. So that's Sahih al-Bukhari. So that's why Abu Sa'id held the opinion based upon that incident, his own experience with the Messenger ﷺ, that it was the 23rd night of Ramadan. Um, other Sahaba also document the same incident, by the way. So Abdullah ibn Unais has a very similar hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu khutbah and his dream and so on and so forth. And um, so we find that we can take a principle from this hadith, first of all, that again it's in the last, the odd nights. The Prophet Sallallahu said, seek it. In the odd nights of the last ten nights, it happened to be the 23rd that year. Okay? Mujahid rahimahullah ta'ala says that Surah Al-Qadr is five ayat. And so there are five possible nights of Laylatul Qadr. So it has to be one of the odd nights of the last ten nights of Ramadan. And there are different ahadith in that regard. The Prophet ﷺ, he also said in a hadith from Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, iltamisuha fil ashr al-awakhir min Ramadan, Laylatul Qadri, fi tasi'atin tabqa, fi sabi'atin tabqa, fi khamisatin tabqa. Prophet ﷺ said, Laylatul Qadr, look for it in the last ten nights. It will be when there are nine seven or five nights or three nights remaining from Ramadan. Okay, so again the Prophet ﷺ is pointing to uh, looking particularly for the odd nights. Now, the question is, did the Prophet ﷺ know that night? Did he know what night was definitively Laylatul Qadr? Well, Aisha radiallahu anha in the famous hadith, she says, Ya Rasulullah, araita in alimtu ayya laylatin hiya Laylatul Qadr. O Messenger of Allah, do you see that if I know what night is Laylatul Qadr, what dua I should make? And that's where the Prophet ﷺ taught her the du'a, Allahumma inna ka'afuwun, tuhibbul afwa, fa'afu anna. Okay? The Prophet ﷺ taught her to make a du'a in those last ten nights. So, you know, the scholars say here, clearly the Prophet ﷺ, had he known the night, he would have told Aisha radiallahu anha. On top of that, what made the Prophet ﷺ forget that night? See, these stories sort of complete each other. When the Prophet ﷺ says that I forgot the night, what made him forget the night? Ubadat ibn Samat radiallahu anhu has an authentic hadith. He says, خرج النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ليخبرنا بليلة القدر فتلاحى رجلان من المسلمين. The Prophet ﷺ came out to tell us what night Laylat al-Qadr was. And then two Muslims started to get into an argument. You want to see the harms of argument in the masjid? Two Muslims got into an argument. So the Prophet ﷺ came out and he saw these two men arguing. He says, خرجت لأخبركم بليلة القدر فَتَلَاحَ فُلَانٌ وَفُلَانٌ I came out to tell you when Laylatul Qadr was, but these two people started to argue. He says, فَرُفِعَتْ Allah lifted it from me. SubhanAllah, Allah Azza wa Jal lifted it. وَعَسَىٰ أَن يَكُونَ خَيْرًا لَكُمْ And it might be better for you that he did so anyway. فَالْتَمِسُوهَا فِي التَّاسِعَ وَالسَّابِعَ وَالْخَامِسَ So seek it out in the ninth, the seventh, or the fifth. Alright, so the Prophet ﷺ was made to forget it due to argument, which if you remember what I said earlier, interacting with people, subhanAllah, made them lose the date of Laylatul Qadr, because two people got into an argument in the masjid. Alright, so the Prophet ﷺ, according to that, he forgot it in that particular year. Alright, now the question becomes, if the Prophet ﷺ said it's in the odd nights, why did he even bother worshipping on the even nights? Because the Prophet ﷺ did i'tikaf for all ten nights. He didn't just do i'tikaf on the odd nights. And Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala, he says in the discussion of the Prophet ﷺ fasting the ninth night with the tenth, or the ninth day with the tenth day of Ashura. The Prophet ﷺ said, if I live to see another year, I'll add tasu'a to Ashura. I'll add the ninth day to the tenth day for fasting. Imam al-Nawi says that one of the reasons why the Prophet ﷺ would do that, he says, uh, the Prophet ﷺ wanted to make sure 
that he got the day in case the Hilal was judged improperly. Which brings about a very interesting discussion. The mess that we have now about when Ramadan starts and when it ends is probably more complicated than it's ever been in Islamic history. Actually it is, because it was from Al-Ahkam al-Sultaniyah. Before the Khalifa, the governor, says when Ramadan starts, it starts. Now in the same city you'll have you know, four or five different start dates to Ramadan. How sure are you that you're even in the odd nights of Ramadan? <laughs> when you're in the last ten nights. How sure are you that you're even in the odd nights? So probably look at the masjid on the 26th night of Ramadan. Right? No one's really there. That could be the 27th night and people are missing out on it. So you're not sure. So they say, so Imam Nawi rahimahullah says the Prophet he, he, you know, he tied his waist belt and he worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all ten nights because there is a possibility that what they assume to be the odd nights might have actually been even nights and vice versa. So you'd be on the safe side um, no matter what it may be. Now there are some ahadith that indicate Laylatul Qadr, particularly in the last week. And again, a very beautiful hadith that involves the Sahaba. Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that a group of Sahaba all had the same dream one night. And all of them dreamt that Laylatul Qadr was in the last week of Ramadan. Alright, so the last seven days of Ramadan, or last seven nights. So the Prophet ﷺ says, أَرَى رُؤْيَاكُمْ قَدْ تَوَاطَطْ فِي السَّبْعِ الْأَوَاخِرِ فِي مَنْ كَانَ I'm sorry, the Prophet ﷺ says, أَرَى رُؤْيَاكُمْ قَدْ تَوَاطَطْ فِي السَّبْعِ الْأَوَاخِرِ He says that I see that your uh, dreams all seem to indicate altogether that it's in the last seven nights. So the Prophet ﷺ says, فَمَنْ كَانَ مُتَحَرِّيَهَا Whoever is looking for that, that Laylatul Qadr, فَلْيَتَحَرَّاهَا فِي السَّبْعِ الْأَوَاخِرِ Let him look for it in the last seven nights. So there are indications now that it's in the last seven nights. We also find an authentic hadith from uh, Abdullah ibn Unais radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this shows you how the Prophet used to deal with the Sahaba. He says that I was present at a gathering with the Prophet and I was from Banu Salama. And um, the Banu Salama said, someone go ask the Prophet about Laylatul Qadr. So he said, I was the youngest of them. And this was the 21st night of Ramadan. So he said, I went out and I did Maghrib with the Prophet ﷺ, then I walked with him back to his house. So the Prophet ﷺ saw me walking with him, so the Prophet ﷺ, he told me to come in and eat with him. So he said, I came in, and the dinner was brought, and I had iftar with the Prophet ﷺ. So when he finished his dinner, the Prophet ﷺ, he stood up, and I stood up with him. And the Prophet ﷺ looked at me and he said, كَأَنَّ لَكَ حَاجَةً He said, you know, surely you had some sort of need that you wanted fulfilled. Was there something you wanted to ask me? So I said, yes. I said, some people of Banu Salama, they, they asked me to ask you about Laylatul Qadr. So the Prophet ﷺ says, Kamil Layla, what's tonight? So I said, it's the 22nd night. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Hiya Layla, it's tonight. Then the Prophet ﷺ paused, then the Prophet ﷺ says, Awil Qabila, or it's tomorrow night. <laughs> so it might be tonight, it might be tomorrow night. Meaning, don't get comfortable. Right? Don't get comfortable. Could be tonight, it could be tomorrow night. So it was the 22nd or the 23rd night um, in that situation. There is another interesting incident that took place with the Prophet ﷺ, or rather with Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that Bilal radiallahu anhu, and this is the end of a long narration, I'm running short of time, so I'm not going to go through it, but the end of it, some of the tabi'een, they asked Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, what did the Prophet ﷺ say about Laylatul Qadr? He said that the Prophet ﷺ informed me in privacy that it's in the last seven nights. So there's a lot of evidence now that's pointing to this last week of Ramadan. Even though the Prophet ﷺ would do i'tikaf, particularly, in the, or he would do i'tikaf throughout the last ten nights, there are many evidences pointing to this idea of looking for it in the last week of Ramadan. Also, the very first hadith I mentioned tonight, right? Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu saying that if you slacked off, the Prophet ﷺ said if you slacked off in Ramadan, then at least make sure that you don't let the last week go past you. All right, except that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with diligence. Now, what are the ahadith that indicate the 27th night in particular? Okay, and I told you guys that some of these might be a little shocking, but I'm going to go through them anyway. Uh, Zir ibn Hubaysh, Zir ibn Hubaysh radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that, I asked Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, or I told Ubay ibn Ka'ab that your brother in faith being Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Your companion Ibn Mas'ud was asked, when is Laylatul Qadr? You know what Ibn Mas'ud said? He said, whoever prays every night of the year will catch Laylatul Qadr. <laughs> SubhanAllah, that's his hikmah. You know, stop looking for the night. 
He said, pray to Hajj. He didn't even say, in Ramadan. He said, whoever prays Qiyamul Layl throughout the year will catch Laylatul Qadr. That's the only way to assure it. And some of the scholars, that, or some people took from that, that Ibn Mas'ud thought Laylatul Qadr was outside of Ramadan. But instead, he's just saying, look, pray every night, and inshallah you'll catch it. So Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, you know, may Allah have mercy on Abu Abdul Rahman. He said he did that so that people wouldn't only pray for one night. He says, but I swear by Allah, without exception, meaning he's taking an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it's the 27th night. He said, how could you say that? He said, by the indication, the sign that the Prophet ﷺ gave to us, the night after the 27th night, about the way that the sun would rise without having any ray in it, I swear by Allah that it's the 27th night. He swore by it. Now what makes this significant? Who is Ubay ibn Ka'ab by the way? This is sort of the subtlety that's lost sometimes. Ubay ibn Ka'ab is the one who leads the Sahaba in Taraweeh. Alright, just to put yourself in the historical context. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he gathered the Sahaba behind one Imam, he gathered them behind Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu. So the, the Imam of the Sahaba said that Laylatul Qadr is the 27th night of Ramadan. So this history of the masjid just being packed on the 27th night, it goes back to the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ. Because their Imam was sure that it was the 27th night. Um, there's also a narration, and I, I would do this whole Sahih or Da'if thing, and I'm pretty sure most of you would say that it's Da'if. There's a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ in Sunan Abi Dawood from Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and it's as clear as it can get that the Prophet ﷺ says, Laylatul Qadri, Laylatul Sab'in wa Ishreen. Laylatul Qadr is the 27th night. It's an authentic hadith from Abu Dawood. The only argument here becomes, was this, was this mawquf to Muawiyah or was it to the Prophet ﷺ? Meaning, was Muawiyah saying that it's the 27th night based upon what I know from the Prophet ﷺ? Or was he saying that the Prophet ﷺ said that it's the 27th night? So if you go to Fath al-Bari by Ibn Hajar, you have 40 different aqwal about this, 40 different statements about this narration. Right? And people just trying to figure out, were these the words of Muawiyah based upon what he heard from the Prophet ﷺ? Or was this the Prophet ﷺ saying that? Okay? In any case, there's another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, also narrated by Muawiyah, إِلْتَمِسُوا لَيْلَةَ الْقَدْرِ فِي آخِرِ لَيْلَةً Seek Laylatul Al-Qadr up until the last night of Ramadan. You know how the masjid dies down after the 27th? Or when, when the masjid finishes the khatm al-Qur'an, tarawih becomes really weird. You just have all these random people leading salah and like one guy reads Qulullah Ahad, the other guy reads Surah Maryam and like everyone's just all over the place and the masjid's half empty at this point because people are doing their Eid shopping now. Prophet says, Iltamisuha fi akhiri layla. Seek it in the last night of Ramadan. How bad would it be for the Ummah if it ended up being the last night of Ramadan? SubhanAllah. So this is something we take from the Prophet but is there, did the Prophet ﷺ, and again, I, I told you I might come to a pretty, to a shocking conclusion, and this is why, this is my research, and I, I challenged myself on this research many, many, many times. Did the Prophet ﷺ used to worship differently on the 27th than he did from the other nights? Okay? I've read many ulama that said no, but there is actually a hadith that suggests that he did. Alright, so this is a hadith from Nu'aym ibn Ziyad, uh, which is an authentic hadith that Nu'man ibn al-Bashir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that we prayed Qiyam with the Prophet sallallahu on the night of the 23rd until one third of the night had passed. Then we prayed with him on the 25th until half of the night had passed. Then we prayed with him on the 27th until we thought we would miss al-Falah. Al-Falah is a suhoor. They used to call it success. So meaning in this hadith what we see is clearly that at least in that particular year, the Prophet ﷺ prayed longer on the 27th, much longer, significantly longer than he did on the other two nights. There's also another authentic hadith that an old man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Nabi Allah, O Prophet of Allah, Inni shaykhun kabirun alilun, yashukku alayy al-qiyam. I'm an old man, I'm sick, and qiyam is hard for me. I can't, I can't pray qiyam all ten nights. فَأْمُرْنِي بِلَيْلَةٍ لَعَلَّ اللَّهُ يُوَفِّقَنِي فِيهَا لِلَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ so tell me what night I should really push myself so that Allah Azza wa might allow me to catch Laylatul Qadr. The Prophet ﷺ says, عَلَيْكَ بِالسَّابِعَ Then focus on the seventh. So the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ to that old man, either he knew that it was the 27th night that particular year, 
Or it's always the 27th night, but the Prophet ﷺ doesn't want us to only pray on the 27th night. Right? But there's a strong... The conclusion that we can make out of all of this is that there's a strong possibility that it is indeed the 27th night and that Allah ﷺ has directed the hearts of the Ummah on that night in particular. There's a strong possibility of that. But the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ, of course, first, were very concerned with people just focusing on one night. And Rasulullah ﷺ used to worship Allah ﷺ for all ten nights. And there still are some other narrations that suggest that it was another night, like the first narration of Abu Sa'id which suggested that it was the 23rd night in that particular year. So it could be that it was one year that it was definitely the 27th, one year that it was definitely the 23rd, and that you know the only way to really have harmony with all of these narrations is that it changes every year. The point is, focus. Do you focus more on the odd nights? Yes. Should you focus more maybe on the 23rd and the 27th? Should you push yourself even further? As long as it's not going to make you lazy on the other nights? Yes. Because there is evidence to suggest that. And it is indeed a, an opinion of many of the scholars of the past. In fact, um, you know, uh, Imam Shaybani claimed it as a jumhur, that it was the majority of the ulama believed it was the 27th. So there is evidence for that. There is basis for that. Push yourself, push yourself, push yourself. And, and, and keep in mind that it's a strong possibility always. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that tawfiq. Allahumma ameen. Now what are some of the signs of Laylatul Qadr? The Prophet ﷺ says, Laylatul Qadri, Laylatun Samha. Laylatul Qadr is a soft night, it's a gentle night. La harra wa la barida. It's not hot, it's not cold, it's a very cool night, it's a very comforting night. Tusbihu shamsu sabihataha da'ifatan hamra. The sun rises that day, da'ifa. Hamra. It's it's weak, meaning it doesn't have rays, and it's it's a reddish complexion. It's a reddish color. So you find every year in Ramadan, people taking pictures of the sun and trying to post them. Now here's the question: Was that a sign for that particular year, like the year where the Prophet ﷺ had mud on his face? It rained a lot that night, or was that, uh, or is that a general sign? Al Qadi Ayad he says there's two possibilities. One of them is that. That's a distinctive sign that Allah Azza wa Jal has given for Laylatul Qadr. All right. So, and and every year you kind of look through those pictures, and some of them seem a little bit more clear, and you don't see the rays on them. And the second one, which he said, is very beautiful. He says that the amount of angels that come down on Laylatul Qadr take away the rays of the sun. <laughs> so Subhanallah, even if a lot of people were praying Qiyamul Layl on a night the amount of malaika that were descending on the earth, their wings, the, the light of their, of, their, of their creation, dulls the light of the sun altogether. So, Allahu Alam, this seems to be a sign of Laylatul Qadr every year. So, looking at the sun and seeing if it's rayless, it's good. However, let's say that you catch it on the 22nd, you know, or 23rd night, someone posts a picture, and you slept through that entire night, and the sun looked absolutely rayless. Should you just say, oh well, maybe next Ramadan? No, al tamisuha. Remember the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, seek it until the very last night. Because imagine how bad you'd feel if another picture came out <laughs> later on in the, in the month. And guess what? It looked, it looked rayless as well, or it looked even more rayless if that's even possible, right? So the point is, Allah left it mysterious to keep you on your toes. And the best part of Laylatul Qadr is the last part of the night, as is the best part of every night. So the best part of Laylatul Qadr is the last third of the night, as well as the Prophet ﷺ says في الليل ساعة that there is an hour of the night that لا يوافقها عبد مسلم يسأل الله من خير الدنيا والآخرة إلا أعطاه الله ما سأل that there is an hour of the night that Allah subhanahu wa taala if He gives you the tawfiq if He gives you the success to be able to ask Allah subhanahu wa taala in that part of the night that He would certainly give you the, whatever you asked Him of this dunya and the akhirah there is nothing you could ask Allah at that point of the night from this world or the hereafter except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give it to you. As for the du'as that we make that night, Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'fu anni. O oh Allah, you are al-afu. You are the one who pardons. You love, the part, you love to pardon, so pardon me, so forgive me. You love to forgive, so forgive me. SubhanAllah, this du'a is very beautiful. In fact, there is also an authentic hadith, by the way, where the Prophet says, Allahumma innaka afuun kareemun. So it's also authentic to add in al karim right? The scholars say, and this is beautiful, because they're both authentic ahadith, if you bring the two together, one of them refers specifically to the hereafter, the other one refers to the hereafter and this world. Because when you invoke al karim 
you're invoking Al Kareem for matters of this world. So to say, Allahumma inna ka afuun kareemun to hibul afwa fafu anni. Oh Allah, you love to forgive. You are generous. You are. You, you, this is who you are, O oh Allah. So forgive me. So pardon me. Give me the best of this world. And hereafter, Ibn Abbas عنه, was asked about other du'as that a person should make on Laylatul Qadr. He said that أحب الدعاء إلى الله أجمعها. He said the most beloved du'as to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the most comprehensive ones. You know, the Prophet ﷺ used to teach us these one sentence du'as, right? And even in the Qur'an, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ اللهم إني أسألك الهدى والتقاء والعفاف والغناء These are small ahadith, small du'as. One sentence du'as that are really good for us to keep in mind inshallah, especially when you find that you're pausing in Laylatul Qadr or that you're between tasks, you're walking or whatever it may be. Keep those du'as in mind as well. Now, here's the thing. What are the things that you should do that night? Alright, what are the things that you should do that night? Um, Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah ta'ala says that Surah Al-Alaq, which comes before Surah Al-Qadr, begins with the command to read the Qur'an. Iqra. Read. And it ends with wasjud wa qtarib, prostrate and come close to Allah subhanahu wa taala. And Allah subhanahu wa taala tells you to read, to to prostrate and to draw closer to your Lord. And Laylatul Qadr is the best time to do that. So He said, Subhanallah, there's a ishar on there, there's a sign in there that this is the best time to do so. Now the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu is general. Man qama Laylatul Qadr, whoever stands up. And qama here does not necessarily mean qiyamul layl doesn't necessarily mean Qiyamul Layl. So what constitutes, what constitutes catching Laylatul Qadr is a very interesting question here. Alright? Uh, Sa'id ibn Musayyib radiallahu anhu says, and this is actually in the Muwatta of Imam Malik, he says, مَنْ شَهِدَ الْعِشَاءَ مِنْ لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ فَقَدْ أَخَذَ بِحَظِّهِ مِنْهَا If you caught Salat al-Isha in Jama'ah on Laylatul Qadr, you took your portion from it. You are counted amongst those who got Laylatul Qadr. <laughs> So at the very least, you can pray Fajr and Isha. And of course, the Prophet said it covers the entire night if you pray that in Jama'ah. Or you can pray with the Imam. The Prophet said whoever stands up with the Imam and prays with the Imam until he finishes, Hatta Yansarif, until he leaves, until he finishes praying, then he gets the full edge of the night. And it's as if he prayed the entire night. So even if you disagree with your Imam on how many rak'ahs he prays, pray with him the entire night that night. Catch Taraweeh. Taraweeh is Qiyamul Layla. So subhanAllah, if you caught Fajr and Isha and you prayed Saraweeh, you're good. You would have already caught the entire night, right? But that doesn't mean that you should relax for the rest of the night. But the point is, is that there's rahmah there. There's mercy there that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a very simple action item. If you can pray Isha and Fajr and Jama'ah, all ten, then you should inshallah. If you can pray with the Imam Taraweeh, all ten, then you should inshallah ta'ala. Now, an Imam al-Shafi rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that, you know, talking about this hadith, he says that I've seen... Many of the, of the tabi'een and the salaf, I've seen many of the predecessors. He said, some of them prefer to spend the night in prayer. Some of them prefer to spend it in Qur'an. Some of them prefer to spend it in dua. And all of it is okay. It all counts. So I get asked that question, you know, for sisters in particular, like what if they can't pray that night? You still can have the full reward of having observed Laylatul Qadr. You can just do du'a. You can you can read the Quran verbally or, or from a book of tafsir. You could do dhikr. You would still catch the entire night. You're just like someone who took their health from Laylatul Qadr, who took their fortune from Laylatul Qadr. You're not deprived in any way because the Prophet ﷺ did not specifically assign prayer to Laylatul Qadr. Salah is not necessarily the only ibadah that you would do on Laylatul Qadr, and the, the surah doesn't mention salah. Nor does the Prophet ﷺ specify salah in particular as the ibadah to do on Laylatul Qadr. Alright? So all of these ibadat, inshallah ta'ala, um, would count. And lastly, you know, just to show you the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, are there other ways to catch the reward of Laylatul Qadr if you missed it during Laylatul Qadr? Alright? Number one, the intention, an niyyah. Alright? Inna mal a'malu bin niyat. Actions are but by intention. If you intended Laylatul Qadr, you receive Laylatul Qadr, even if you did not live to see it. Alright? As the ulama say, even if you died before the last ten nights, but you had that intention, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, Allah writes you down the full amount. Alright? Number two, you made the intention for a particular night. So there's the general intention, then there's a specific intention you made before you went to sleep at night. You set your alarm for 3 a.m. You said, I'm going to wake up and pray Laylatul Qadr. But instead, you slept through it. 
Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said that if a person goes to sleep intending Qiyamul Layl and they don't wake up, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes them down the full amount, وَنَوْمُهُ sadaqa, And his sleep was a charity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You still got the full reward. Alright, let's say that again, a traveler or a sick person, the Prophet ﷺ said in authentic hadith from Abu Musa, if a person misses an action they would have done had they not been traveling or sick, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would write it down for them fully, as if they were healthy and they were at home. So that's also written down for you. What about at other times of the year? There's a weak hadith from Abu Huraira. Again, I would, I would uh, go through this exercise with you guys, but for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. There's a weak hadith that gets circulated around the time of Dhul-Hijjah. It is narrated, but it's a weak hadith. There's a lot from the Senate that the Prophet ﷺ says that there are no days in the world in which worship is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the first 10 days of Dhul-Hijjah. Fasting one of those days is equivalent to fasting for the year. And one night of Dhul-Hijjah is, is, is equal to Laylatul Qadr. That hadith is weak. All right? Now, what about this hadith? All right? From Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that whoever performs wudu and performs wudu well, and then attends Isha in jama'ah, in congregation, and then prays four rak'ahs after that. All right? Reciting in there, bowing, prostrating properly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would write down for him the reward of Laylatul Qadr. What do you guys think? Sahih or Daif? It's actually authentic. It's narrated from Ka'ab, it's narrated from Abdullah ibn Amr, it's narrated from Aisha, it's narrated from Ibn Mas'ud. They are Sahih to them, meaning it's mawquf to them. These are the statements of them, but the scholars of Hadith say there is no way all of these Sahaba are speaking about something like this without revelation, without from being from the Prophet Wasallam. That whoever prayed Isha, did wudu properly, prayed Isha and Jama'ah, and then after that, prayed four rak'ahs, right, this is not sunnah mu'akkadah, but this is something you would do at another time then, or in different times. Four rak'ahs, without uh, doing salam between them. Meaning you would pray it like you prayed your Isha. The norm of sunnahs, and nawafil in general, is mathna mathna, two by two. But this particular... Uh, these particular narrations say that you would pray four rak'ahs the way that you prayed Salatul Isha. كُتِبَ لَهُ أَجْرُ لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ Allah would write for him the reward of Laylatul Qadr. That's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He always gives you other opportunities. You can't do Hajj, you can do Umrah and Ramadan, you get the reward of Hajj inshallah. It doesn't remove the obligation, but the reward is there. You can't do Hajj, you can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until Duha, until the sunrise, you get the reward of Hajj. Right? So there are different ibadat that give us that reward bi idhnillahi ta'ala. The point is, in conclusion of this, obviously as we get into these last 10 nights inshallah, treat every night as if it's Laylatul Qadr. Even the quote-unquote even nights, because your calculations might be wrong, and your global moon sighting, and you know, whatever that is, <laughs> whatever that even means anymore, your global moon sighting might be off, right? Uh, someone might have had a local moon sighting and your imam or the council that you go to didn't like them or didn't, didn't accept their moon sighting, but they might have actually been right. Okay, there are so many different possibilities. Look for it every single night. Start at Maghrib. Don't talk to people more than you need to talk to people. Don't get involved in conversations that are not going to be good for you or healthy for you. Right? Try to do whatever ibadah you can. If you, if you tire from praying, then take a break and do dua. And if, you know, you don't have to do what everyone else is doing. Okay? Try to just alternate your du'as, do different ibadat, do different acts of worship, just keep yourself engaged throughout the night insha'Allah ta'ala, and that's the only way to guarantee that you would catch it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from being amongst those that are mahrumin, that are forbidden or deprived from the blessing of this night and from the blessings of this month. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and to allow us to observe uh, Laylatul Qadr in full. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, to make it easy for us this year, inshallah ta'ala, to catch Laylatul Qadr. Allahumma ameen. So what I want to do, inshallah ta'ala, in conclusion, first of all, alhamdulillah, I mean, it's been a, a good month of, of Ramadan for us, inshallah ta'ala, and, and I ask Allah to accept it from all of us. Um, many people have been keeping up with the People of Qur'an series. Ustad Nu'man has on Bayana TV, so that's on YouTube, on Bayana TV. Um, we have uh, Surah Al-Rahman, um, which is from... Uh, which is also with the Stad Nu'man, which is on Bayna TV. And then, uh, inshallah ta'ala, I have a, a major announcement that, 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 I'm, that I'm making now. It should be uploaded to my Facebook already I, I, on my cover photo, is it? If you check out my cover photo right now on my Facebook page, 
Inshallah Ta'ala, uh, Inspiration 2 is being released on Bayana's YouTube channel as well. And Alhamdulillah Rabbil Ameen, we've recorded six episodes. Twelve episodes is a little difficult. We've gotten six episodes. The trailer is going to be released, Inshallah Ta'ala, on Saturday, July 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be even better than season one, Inshallah Ta'ala, and it's going to be coming to youtube.com slash bayana, Inshallah Ta'ala. So please make sure you subscribe, let other people know as well. Get the word out, Inshallah Ta'ala. And there's a lot more that's going to be coming, Inshallah, to Bayana TV and to, and to our YouTube channel, Inshallah Ta'ala. I'm going to go through some of these questions right quick, um, and, and, uh, and then I'll let you guys go, Inshallah Ta'ala. So there's, first of all, women's issues. Can women observe i'tikaf in their home? That's number one. And can a menstruating woman who cannot pray still receive the blessing of Laylatul Qadr? We already um, answered that. But can women observe, uh, lay, uh, can they observe i'tikaf in their home? There are different forms of i'tikaf. There's the technical i'tikaf, which is i'tikaf in the masjid, which is for men and for women, by the way. If your masjid has the accommodations for sisters to be able to do that, then, then it's a sunnah for women to do as well. So the wives of the Prophet ﷺ used to observe i'tikaf as well, and some of the sahabiyat. But again, it has to be the proper accommodation. All right? I don't, we don't want any funny business happening and then Bayina getting blamed. All right? So if women have their area and men have their area, then i'tikaf can take place, inshallah, for both men and women. That's the technical i'tikaf, which is seclusion in the masjid of the Prophet, of the Prophet ﷺ or any other masjid. Now, as far as the spiritual meaning of i'tikaf, which isn't the technical way, all right? which is basically just isolation and, and you know, secluding yourself from people and secluding yourself in ibadah, that's also rewardable. And that's also something that's blessed and it's also something... The, there's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, what يَسَعْكَ بَيْتِكَ Let your house... I mean, I don't even know how to translate that properly, but find comfort in your home, basically. Okay? And we find, you know, different narrations of different salaf. Hafsa bin Sirin radiallahu ta'ala anhu rahimahullah had her own masjid basically in her home. Right, where she would go into seclusion, she wouldn't come out um, except to fulfill her needs, basically. So, yes, men and women. And by the way, you know, if you're not doing the i'tikaf in the masjid, all right, then qiyam as a whole is better at home than it is in the masjid. So qiyam, aside from i'tikaf, is just it's better at home than it is at the masjid anyway. So if you can find those moments alone, inshallah, I mean, at home and seclude yourself and pray and do whatever you're going to do, that is rewardable, and that is a way, inshallah ta'ala, of observing um, Laylatul Qadr. Uh, the second issue here is repentance. If a person drank alcohol or took any intoxicant right before Ramadan, can they still seek forgiveness and the blessings of Laylatul Qadr? Yes. If there was any time where you were going to be forgiven for a major sin, it's going to be in this night, in this month and in this night. So whatever it is that you did before Ramadan, in fact, whatever it is that you did in the beginning of Ramadan, this is the time to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and really, um, and really uh, you know, try to maintain that closeness to Him. Uh, the, the next question is, the time between Maghrib and Isha is really short. What are some of the most beneficial and productive ways to observe the last 10 nights? Yes, the time between Maghrib and Isha is short, so really what you want to do is, you know, your iftar is a ibadah, your salat al-Maghrib is a ibadah. If you pray the sunnah of Maghrib on those nights, you know, if you've been slacking with the sunnah of Maghrib, but in these last 10 nights, you make sure you just pray the two rak'ah sunnah of Maghrib. You eat your iftar. Again, it's not halal to have some conversation. Just watch yourself carefully. Don't do anything that's going to destroy the ibadah of the night. That's the point that I was making. But what are some things that I would recommend? Just sit, you know, before, before Salat al-Isha. If you can, if you, can you know, have iftar in the masjid and stay until Isha, for example, because one ibadah, one form of worship is, is staying in the masjid between two salats. So if you can do that, then do that. Then eat your iftar in the masjid, stay there until Isha. After you eat your iftar, just sit for 10 minutes before Isha. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's fine. Um, so, so the point is that you don't let all of, any of that time go to waste. Is it halal to sleep on Laylatul Qadr for some time? Take a break and take, you know, take a nap? Yeah, it's, it's fine. The Prophet Wasallam, he said that when a, when a person doesn't know what they're saying anymore, <laughs> right, and they're barely standing up and, you know, you don't know if the imam is in ruku or in sujood. You don't know if you read Al-Baqarah or Al-Fatiha, right? That's pretty extreme. But, um, but you know, the Prophet said, take a break. Give your eyes a rest. Take a nap. It's fine. Tell someone to wake you up, all right? Put your alarm clock on. But it's okay to take, you know, to take a nap and things of that sort. Especially, again, considering, you know, if a person has to go to work at 9 a.m. in the morning, 
then they have to sleep. That's fine. Sleeping can be a ibadah as well. Mu'adh radiallahu anhu says, inni ahtasibu nawmati kama ahtasibu qawmati. I seek the reward of my sleep like I do for my qiyam. So when you take that nap, make your nap a ibadah. So you're taking that nap so you can wake up and worship Allah better for the last hour of the night or the last hour and a half of the night. So it's okay to take a nap inshallah ta'ala. Just don't do anything counterproductive. So the best way to be productive in Laylatul Qadr is not do anything counterproductive. <laughs> don't do anything that will deprive you of the mercy of Allah or the blessings of Allah on that night. Uh, the last question, how do I ask Allah to open my heart and, and place faith within? Uh, these are questions from the live feed, by the way. So, look, one of the things that, that we, we do sometimes, we set these expectations for ourselves. And when we don't meet those expectations, then we're just completely deflated. Don't go into these last ten nights saying that if I don't break out into tears and scream and cry, then it was a failure. Okay? And that my iman means nothing to me. Don't go into, that, don't go into these nights with that expectation. Go into these nights with husn al-dhan billah, with having good expectations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assume well of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Insha'Allah Ta'ala, so long as you don't do anything counterproductive and you worship Allah in some way, shape, or form on these last 10 nights, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala will give you the reward of it. Okay? Now what if you sat, if it's, if, you know, to, how do I ask Allah to open my heart and place faith within? You say, Oh Allah, open my heart and place faith within it. The du'as that you make, they don't have to be calculated, they don't have to be poetic. Alright, you hear all the, the witr du'as in the last 10 nights. And it's funny because some of them are making du'a for, for Saudi Arabia wa sa'ira bilad al-Muslimin because they copied Sheikh Sudais' du'a or Sheikh Mashari's du'a or something like that or Sheikh Sulaim's du'a and they brought it. <laughs> Stop. Make du'a in your own language from your own heart. You don't have to sound poetic when you make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, Allah likes your brokenness sometimes. You know? <laughs> he likes you to sound broken. He likes you to sound... He likes you to stutter a little bit sometimes, as long as it's sincere. So stop trying to, you know, meet these 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 standards, right? Instead, just observe these nights, inshallah ta'ala. And lastly, I'm suffering from hopelessness. What should I do? Um, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have given you this opportunity had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not desired well for you. So think of it that way. All right, Allah Azza wa Jalla allowed you to live to see these moments. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave you tawfiq, inshallah Taala, to to pray and to to read Quran and do du'a in these nights. This could be the spark, inshallah Taala, that completely, you know, changes your life. One thing to do as well, and this is just general in du'a, um, to connect your du'a to your tawbah, to connect du'a to repentance. Meaning what? You repent sincerely to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for something that you've done or are doing, and you say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you commit that you're never going to return to those sins, and then you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something. Why? Because you've put something first, you've put something, you, you, you've, you've, you've presented something for yourself, and so it's only natural that you will receive inshaAllah ta'ala. Alright? The, the whole uh, Sayyid al-Istighfar. Right? Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha la anta khalaqtani wa ana abduk wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'dika ma stata'tu a'udhu bika min sharri ma sana'tu abu'u laka bi ni'matika alayhi wa abu'u bi dhanbi faghfir li fa innahu la yaghfiru dhunuba illa ant So the whole, you know, the first five, six lines of the dua are you presenting your own imperfection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admitting His perfection, admitting His blessings upon you and admitting your failure to respond properly and then faghfir li, forgive me and the greatest thing you can ask Allah for on Laylatul Qadr, and this is what Aisha asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like, if I have to, if, if, if I know I'm in Laylatul Qadr, like if I'm in it, and I know, like I see the signs, I'm, in, I'm, I'm engrossed in dua, what dua should I make? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, direct it to the Akhirah, right? Ask Allah to forgive you and pardon you. Because there's nothing that you will gain from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala greater than forgiveness from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So just keep asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for forgiveness, inshallah. Keep yourself busy with istighfar. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and overlook our shortcomings in Ramadan and in, in our qiyam and in Laylatul Qadr. And we ask Allah azza wa jalla to give us the full reward of it. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khayran. Subhanakallah wa hamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha la anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alaykum. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.